Good morning. I'm Jim Murray from the Presidential Precinct. Uh, thank you, William, and thank you, the American Bar Association, for your support today. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by uh, introducing our 23 visitors. I'd ask you please stand. Our visiting leaders. Thank you. I'll not attempt to speak your names, but I am hopeful that during the course of the day that we will get to hear from each of you and that each of you will have an opportunity to express your own concerns and opinions. Uh, I start with our guests because more than anyone else you will meet today, you represent the mission of the precinct. Uh, we have a day ahead full of a remark remarkable array of thought leaders, scholars, executives, and yes, even some VIPs. These people are important, and we are proud, and we are honored to be associated with them. But the presidential precinct is more than impressive friends and headline-generating events. We are a partnership of two historic universities and three of homes belonging to the men we call the five founding fathers of the United States. The precinct provides a venue. It's a physical venue like this, but also a virtual venue, an online venue, for people like you to come together to discuss and collaborate over what we call nation building. We're designed to be a place for people from around the world to gather to study ideas, study ideas free from ideology, a place to study how the past and the experience of others can inform the decisions you make about your futures, a place to study the lessons of the past and to learn from your peers, and to study how to make your country a better place for your children and your grandchildren. If we look around us, every country, every, every nation has its own problems, and no people have the right answers. But there are some answers, some common to, to the, some of these common political and civic problems, and if not answers, there are best practices that have proven effective over the arc of history. Let me illustrate with some examples. These are examples of things we hope to discuss with visitors like you. And one kind of dispassionate way to figure what, what are the challenges of the world and what kind of examples, what are the kinds of things we cover, is let's look at the headlines. One dispassionate way to look at the headlines is let's look at last week's issue of The Economist, the British publication that covers the whole world. Here are the headlines. In the Middle East, ISIS is developing a priceless, uh, is destroying priceless historic artifacts that chronicle the culture of their forefathers. In the U.S., Congress and, pre and the President accuse each other of violating the U.S. Constitution. In Argentina, the economy is deteriorating while the President fights a, a scandal over an assassination. In Russia, we have another political assassination, media censorship, and an unresolved military adventure in Ukraine. In Nigeria, great economic pro progress is being overshadowed by Boko Haram's religious revolutionaries who are accused of gen genocide. And, they, and they're in an ongoing war to try and capture Amer Africa's fastest growing economy. In Turkey, decades of intermittent strife between the government and the Kurdish population is, surprisingly, according to The Economist, being overshadowed by talk of peaceful coexistence with the Kurdish population. Meanwhile, the government of Turkey appears to be steering course towards a secular, <clears throat> away from secularism, towards a religious orthodoxy, while in some in the Kurdish population, we have football growing in popularity amongst women. In Mexico, in contrast to regions like Brazil and Venezuela, the economy continues to grow and prosper, but the education system continues to fail. And contrast all of that with Somalia, where there is virtually no government, and the people are struggling to develop systems and habits to govern themselves without leaders. That's a partial list, let's say a random list of things happening around the world. What do they have in common? Well, you'd probably say nothing. But think again. In fact, they have two things in common, all those stories. First, 
Each is a story of success or failure of leadership. All these headlines arise from decisions, human decisions made over the course of months, years, and decades, decisions made by leaders. Secondly, every one of these developing stories has happened before. You can look at 5,000 years of human history, back to the, kingdom, the kingdoms of ancient Egypt, to the Persian Empire, the earliest democracies of Greece, the great kingdoms of China, the Mayan city empires, and Central America, back to the 19th and 20th centuries, and we will find examples of these same human stories. Just look, and we will find the same human striving, greed, wisdom, leadership, charity. At the precinct, we're deeply rooted in history. We believe that the history of tomorrow, the history to be written next year and the years after, can be molded by you, our visitors, by the leaders of tomorrow. To be clear, we do not preach about American democracy. We are blessed that three of America's five founding fathers all lived close by each other in the area of Virginia we call the precinct. These men were, by the standards of any age, any country, any culture, truly remarkable men. Unlike most revolutionaries of history, these men did not launch their revolution by taking up arms. They took up books. They spent their lives devoted to the study of history, philosophy, science, and government. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe set examples that we hope to follow today. They scoured the writings of ancient Greece and the Roman philosophers, social critics of the Renaissance, the great humanist philosophers, and every other example of good government that they could find. Thomas Jefferson studied not only the Christian Bible, he studied the Koran. James Madison read Greek and Roman philosophy in the original languages. James Monroe and his family spoke to each other in French at dinner because James Monroe valued the lessons of other cultures. These three presidents were curious, open-minded, vastly well-educated, and they were messianic in their striving to find a way to build a better nation. Was the nation they built a success? Well, I'll leave you and history to be the judge of that. But we can say it's certainly not perfect. The leaders of America have much to learn as well. So we at the precinct, we do not preach. A century ago, the great Spanish philosopher George Santayana said, those who cannot remember history are condemned to repeat it. If you walk in the front door downstairs, you'll see virtually the same thing on the wall. It reads, what's past is prologue. Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, and the other leaders who designed and built America had few truly original ideas. The point is that they did not need to look far to find the lessons they needed to build a new government for the people of the United States. The same is true today. <clears throat> the same is true for people trying to build developing nations. Here we encourage everyone to look at the world's history at the well-educated leaders, including our three, Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, and look at the emphasis that they put on education. All three <coughs> were on the board of visitors, the governing body of the University of Virginia, and the University of Virginia was founded by Thomas Jefferson, and Jefferson and Monroe both studied at William and Mary. We have these great roots to these great institutions, and they demonstrate the importance that these men placed on education. We, too, place a great value on education. And throughout their lives, these men that we copy, we encourage you to copy. The final thing that I'd like to say about the prethinks is that we're not here to sell anything. We're not here to sell any particular ideology or political principles. Thomas Jefferson once said, and we use it at the precinct. It's right there on the bottom of this sign. 
He spoke about the University of Virginia. He said, this institution will be based on the illimitable freedom of the human mind. For here we are not afraid to follow the truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error, so long as reason is left free to combat it. Jefferson's words apply to the precinct today. We hope that today's short program shows you just enough about the precinct and a few of the issues we hope to help you with and, with other, and to help other leaders with. And we hope we'll give you a glimpse of the tremendous resources we can help bring to bear to deal with those issues. We hope that you'll return to the precinct, perhaps in person, but certainly online, and join in the conversation in helping your country and other countries raise the quality of life for humankind everywhere. We're proud to have with us today some important and famous people, but we do not want to lose sight of our mission, which is to help leaders like you build successful, prosperous, and peaceful nations. We begin this morning's program with a discussion of the rule of law and the law and its effect on economic development. These are laws that arise out of, as William said, the Magna Carta. Specifically, we begin to look at how it is the economies of your countries can be affected by the implementation of rule of law. I have to confess that when we first took up this topic and said we were going to work on this program today, we planned a five-day program on that one element. Five days on that one element. Because perhaps nothing is more important to anyone in the developing world than to understand how the rule of law can incentivize capital investment, create jobs, increase prosperity, and improve the quality of life. So let's get started. I'd like to introduce Dean Dave Douglas. <clears throat> 